Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our, our Giving Tuesday now, uh, another in, in a series of our Giving Tuesday live Facebook Live events. We're so happy that you could be with us. We're just waiting a few minutes as folks jump in and uh, join with us. Um, we've had a really good day so far. We've had uh, an amazing schedule, and we're kind of in the middle, winding down, but but still in the middle. We had our kickoff this morning with Gary and I talking to everybody, and then we had a story time with Mr. Gary. We had a fantastic lunch and learn um, workshop on how to keep children and students with autism safe on the internet, which so many of them are on the internet, especially now. Um, we also had Princess Elsa reading a story. We heard from our music man, Mr. Jim, and uh, Natalia and Mercedes, our, our Zumba instructors, did a really great check-in with us too. Um, we also did our, our usual virtual yoga today, and we'll be seeing Miss Jen again right after this session. And uh, all that stuff is, if you missed it, you didn't miss it because the um, videos are all on our Facebook page and we will also be getting them on our YouTube page. So if you didn't get to see any of that stuff, please, uh, please go back and take a look. Um, really good stuff there. And for the rest of the day after this, we have another yoga check-in from Miss Jen, just a little little one with a, a couple of tips that she has from us. And then Mr. Scott, the music man, is going to bring it all home at 5.30 um, and end the day with some, some silliness there. So um, what we have for you now is I'm on here with Dr. Bobby Gallagher, BCBA, and um, Hillary Freeman, special needs attorney. And what we're going to do is just We've had a couple of questions that have come up frequently. So we're just gonna put some of those out here and just discuss those and see if we can give you some guidance and some answers along that. So to begin with, um, we talked a lot about, we actually did, Hillary did, and, and Bobby was involved too, a workshop uh, or a webinar for us on IEPs. And one of the big things that we, we wanted to talk about is what are some of the potential red flags we might see in IEPs, especially in light of the current situation mm -hmm. with, with the distance learning. So who wants to take that one? I'll start off. Um, I think the biggest red flag that I'm seeing already is that districts are changing IEPs to uh, reflect that the student is in the home environment. So they're either changing the IEP to reflect that student, sh student should be on home instruction or that they're reducing services because the services can't be provided during this time. What's very important to remember is that the IEPs should not be modified to reflect reflect this environment. In other words, the, uh, the service, the IEP should be developed to confer a meaningful educational benefit upon the child um, to the, and the services sh should be provided to the maximum extent possible. And to the extent that they cannot be provided, it should be made up through compensatory education when it can be provided. So that's a really key thing to remember throughout the IEPs. So I, I don't want, I, I, a red flag should go up if they're changing the IEP to reflect that the services can't be provided in the home. Um, so that's a big one. The second piece to that point is no, ex that districts are maybe removing extended school year from the IEPs because they're not sure if it will be able to be provided. That should not happen either. Um, they're not doing transition planning because they can't, they, it's very difficult to administer the assessments or to take them out into the community. Again, everything, the, the IDEA says that it, there are certain, there are certain requirements that should go, should be put forth through the IEP process. And uh, the federal government came out and said, we're not waiving those requirements. So the district has an obligation to make sure that these services are provided to, you know, to ensure that your children make progress in all environments. Bobby? Yeah, um, I think my red flags come from a different place with all of this and that having parents look at what their existing IEP say and how mm. they see that at home those aren't actually maybe happening, some of the goals. And and we've talked about this before, but really just kind of looking at um, the subjectiveness of the criteria to meet a goal. So in, And what I mean by that is if it says that your child can do something with minimum, minimal prompts and you and the teacher have not discussed what minimal prompts means – 
So you think that your child can do this by, you know, just pointing to something while you're home because you thought that was minimal and you're finding out they're not successful, that maybe minimal prompts is actually more intrusive than, than what your, you know, your interpretation of it is. And so those types of things really now I think parents might see should be spelled out much more clearly for everyone to understand exactly where the child is supposed to be by the end of a year. And, um, and also where those um, determinations were made as far as assessment tools that were used. And so, you know, are we asking the child to do something that they're actually capable of doing based on an assessment? Or did we choose something just simply because they're eight years old and eight-year-olds do this, you know, so, and families may realize that if we do it by age that we find ourselves over prompting children because they might not have the prerequisite skills to get it done. So those would be some areas that I would, I would say have popped up. And, and so when we see things, when we see these, um, these red flags, we should, we should still be contacting the child study team the way we would under any other circumstances. Yeah, right? Nothing has changed. You should be contacting the case manager. You should be contacting your teachers to say this just doesn't jive. Um, or, you know, you can use a different term if you'd like, <laughs> but the, the, the goals are not what I'm seeing at home. If you have any concerns about the IEP, go through the normal process. IEP meetings are happening virtually. Evaluation planning meetings are happening virtually. Case managers should be available to address your concerns. Concerns. And if they're not, then go up the chain and go to the director of special services. Okay, another um, another question that just came out of the, the last thing that we just talked about is waivers. Been a lot of talk about waivers and what is a waiver? And should you sign a waiver? And can you be compelled? <laughs> no, <laughs> don't sign no. the waiver. <laughs> So what was happening, uh, this is a huge source of contention, especially amongst the special education bar. What was happening is that um, school districts were sending home forms for parents to sign in before they would agree to provide virtual instruction um, or instruction over the computer. And those waivers were basically asking the district to say, We'll provide this, but we'll provide this service, but you can never come after us if these services are inappropriate. You're not entitled to compensatory education. You can't challenge the appropriateness of the services. You can't challenge the quality of these services, um, but we'll provide it if you give up all of those rights. And uh, of the parent special education bar really made hay, for lack of a better term, of these, once we found out about these waivers, and we brought this to the attention of the New Jersey Department of Education, and uh, because they're illegal, they're gener neurotypically developing students are not asked to waive their rights away. The IDEA doesn't allow parents to waive their rights in, in exchange for services. The districts have to provide it regardless. So uh, we we brought it to the attention of the New Jersey Department of Education, and they issued guidance on April 30th to the school districts, telling them you cannot have parents sign these waivers. Um, in order, in exchange for services, you have to provide the services anyway. Uh, the second piece in the same guidance memo was that you, um, districts were also insisting that parents sign a consent form before virtual instruction was would be provided. Virtual, they cannot, re they cannot insist that parents sign the consent form. They or they cannot wait for the parents to sign the consent form to provide the services. They have to provide it regardless of whether the parents sign the consent form. The IDEA doesn't doesn't restrict their ability to provide the services based on parental consent. Well, that's a that's a clear clear answer. That's a no. <laughs> I could not have been more clear about that. <laughs> those waivers. If you've already signed it, they're technically they're unenforceable. But if you want to contact your case manager and tell them I no longer waive these waive these rights, um, please confirm you're still providing the services. I would encourage you to do that. Um, anything to add, Bobby? No, waivers are not my not my area, but I mean all I know is just say no. <laughs> <laughs> That's <a> good advice. <laughs> and here's one that that will be a, a part of your area and it's it's a big one, it's a big question and it's a big concern and that's regression. Oh. Um some some to be honest, I think there's some students who do well in this kind of environment, you know, with with this kind of and there are a lot of students who are not doing well in this kind sure. of environment and the, sure. and the things that's happening. And so if you your child is a student who is not and you're concerned about regression, um, what do you do? 
um, specifically, should you document it? And if so, how? Okay. Um, yes, you should document it. I think the challenge we're going to have is do we have an idea of where they were and do you have that documented? So is there somewhere where we can say that the child had these skills at one point? Uh, above and beyond just that I know he used to be able to do this. And and the reason I say that is we've often had that discrepancy where parents will say, my child can do something at home, but they and, and the district will say, well, we've never seen him do it at school. So is it really a regression based on it other than, right? So do we have documentation where the child was able to do it at school and now they're not able to? And is it a true regression or is it a lack of generalization in that they can't do it at home, but they could do it at school? And if once school opened again, is it going to be something that just comes right back to them? So there's so many things we have to look at. Um, but we, if you're telling me this is a true regression, that a child had a skill that you know, let's say toilet training. I think I've heard a lot of families talk about toilet training yeah. regression um, mm -hmm. most recently. And, um, and maybe because there's a lot of being out of their routine, but if they mm -hmm. were typically toilet trained on Sunday, you know, and they weren't in school, then they should still be toilet trained now. Um, however, there could be a, a decrease in diligence from, you know, all of us like keeping up with something just because, you know, on Sunday I can do it, but all day long, Monday through Friday, you know, parents might have to work. If there is that, then we know that they didn't wear, they weren't wearing diapers and now they're back to wearing diapers or going through soiled pants. And I think that's a pretty clear um, way of counting that regression has absolutely happened or that assessment has happened. Um, I would say that we have to talk to the district about how do we keep this back up again or how do you know your the team that you have at school, whether your teachers are calling in, your BCBAs, your OTs, everybody that would kind of help on this. Um, when they're calling in, it has to be clearly documented to them that he's losing, you know, he's losing a skill. It's going backwards. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and as opposed to saying don't panic, which would probably be the first response to a lot of people, they have to give you some clear set of strategies on how to implement something that will increase it back and have to take into consideration that um, the environment in which they implemented it the first time around has very much changed. So they may need a new set of skills to do, you know, a new, they can't ask mom and dad, I guess what I'm saying is to like take them to the bathroom every 15 minutes, because that may have been what they did at school. But a new um, plan would have to come into place for this environment that he's in now to get it back up. To that point, you can add uh, to, with with regard to how to manage the IEP when that happens. Um, you could, there can be amendments to the IEP to add or add services for the home environment. So if they were getting behavioral consultation in school or they weren't getting it in school and now they need it in school, you should contact the case manager to say we need to amend this IEP to reflect behavioral consults in the home um, for, for for to to general to help generalize these skills across environments. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, impulse control. That's another thing we're hearing a lot about, being able to um, handle that. People are seeing that more and more, I think, in the home, and, and parents are wondering, how can I handle impulse control? And um, impulse control could be anything from, you know, a child who's bolting or, or darting or taking something or running. I mean, maybe you have more examples of what that might look like, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I'm going to, you know, obviously kind of go back to what do the behaviors look like for this, right? As when we kind of label something as impulse control, and it's going to be so individualized to somebody. Um, I think some of the challenges that we're having, again, is that parents have to work, right? And, um, and be available to their jobs at this particular moment. Children are at home and wanting to access their parents. And I think some of this is just coming about from the fact that there's, you know, you're right there. Why aren't you with me on this day? And kind of really um, like just what's the word I'm looking for? Um, trying to access attention, trying to, you know, there's so many things that have happened right now. And so um, actually I'm glad Hillary brought up bringing in, they may need behavioral supports now that they didn't need before because now they're being taught in this setting with these conditions that they had never had before. So I think we have to be really clear when we say impulse control or is it, you know, is it, 
is it being driven by some other motivation for them to do something? Um, you know, bolting is certainly going to get mom or dad off of, you know, this headset and all of this if they have to work from home and get them to run out the door. Uh, you know, and, and it's clearly going to get them to pay attention to them. And so, um, and you know, or if you pick up a phone, it's classically, right, that a child, the second you pick up the phone, the child has a million <laughs> questions for you. Um, so all of which, you know, you were able to do and get done when these two separate, when these environments were separated. And so I think really, you know, um, if we could talk about some of those more specifically with some of our families, be happy to help out in that way, because every one of those behaviors that they're labeling as impulse may be looked at really very differently. So I wouldn't want to give a global response to impulse control, but I want everybody to understand why it may have increased based on this new, you know, this new environment that we're in. I think also access to devices, you know, th that they may that may be used for education. We're hoping that they'll use it for education and maybe they want to use it for the games that they're used to playing and, and that right. kind of stuff. I think. Well, and yeah. you have siblings, right? If you have siblings in an environment now together that maybe weren't spending as much time in that setting together and so one's grabbing something out of another one's hand or, or just, mm -hmm. you know, or, I mean, and sometimes impulse control can be behavioral in, in, or, you know, aggressive in that somebody just walks by and, yeah smack somebody in the back of the head because you know it's a lack of impulse control maybe but at the same time that can be looked at as a possible attention seeking behavior if they've suddenly become aggressive towards their their siblings um but again that will pull mom or dad off of you know this device and get them back into the room so it's really kind of a challenge that way or get somebody to leave the room mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? or get or get me put in a place where i can leave the room all kinds of things are mm -hmm. or could be the possible you know uh, reinforcing factors behind those. So I shouldn't hit you on the head anymore. Not no. Okay. no I'm starting to hurt. No. <laughs> um, the next topic is is another really big one, and that's um, sadness, depression, and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Anxiety always the big one. We do we we did actually a couple of conferences this past year just about anxiety and how to handle it, and you know what causes it and all of that stuff. And so um, from from a, a behavioral standpoint and from a legal standpoint, are there any suggestions, um, guidance for, for, for behavioral, you know, from the behavioral point of view and um, from maybe more so from the legal point of view, is there anything parents can do to modify the program to maybe address mm -hmm. some of those issues? So maybe if we start with Bobby, maybe yep. what are some of the things you can do and then maybe go to Hillary for how do we do it? Yep. Right. Um, well, and we're going to look at the differences on what your child age, you know, ability mm -hmm. to comprehend sort of information and language, um, all are going to play a factor into what we can possibly do. So what we know right now is um, that the research behind mindfulness is has been working with um, individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, and when, when I say that, I know that some people will say to me that their child um, wouldn't be able to understand the concept behind mindfulness, but the research is actually showing us that if the caregiver does the mindfulness training, it has a direct effect on the child's behavior. And so I want to just make sure that parents understand that if they're keeping themselves healthy and really kind of tending to their own needs, that their reactions to some of their children's anxieties can possibly come down to a different level and be able to um, have a better understanding of what's happening in the moment. So that's there and there's also there there are mindfulness techniques for individuals who can understand um and i would highly recommend you know meditation on the soles of the feet is one that's used often with individuals with developmental disabilities because it has some really clear steps if they search that they'll find it on the internet a pdf on the internet no problem um but that would be one and then there are some curriculum out there that um our schools could be using to work with if the child receives counseling services and that are that have been known to be effective for individuals with um, autism. And so I would really say that they would have to start to use something versus traditional um, counseling methods. And that's something that maybe the families might still be getting those services, but maybe they were never really the right type of services for their child to begin with. And now 
being put into an anxious situation has has exacerbated it and shown that what they were receiving wasn't effective. Um, as far as any sort of direct things that they can do, I think I have to always say to families, you know, they've got to, there are times when you have to pick your battles, right? And there are times when you have to say that we need a calm and um, I can only learn under calm situation. So trying to keep the pressure on your child to just get through one more math problem or one more something really isn't worth the battle that it may set off in internally, you know, and, and not going to go through the whole lessons of the internal states and bodies, but um, it just, it's not worth that fight. And I, I would ask parents to just save that one, you know, save that math problem for tomorrow and, you know, or save something so that they can kind of get through the day. They may have to break up the work differently, you know, to help their child. Yeah. And I have to say it just, and this has come up with almost every parent that has called into us um, for, for the BCBA. Um, our children are totally confused why their parents are now their teachers mm -hmm. and very anxious over the fact that this could be a permanent situation. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they are not being told when it's going to end, nor are we. And they, they didn't want it. They didn't ask for it. Mm -hmm. And now they don't know when it's going to be over. And if any of those things were happening to you in any other situation, even if it was just a noise, you didn't want it, you didn't ask for it, nobody's telling you when it's going to be over, it will cause you, you know, considerable anxiety. And so that's something that our children all have to, are dealing with at this particular time. Yeah, indeed. And, and the anxiety level on the part of the parents as mm -hmm. well, who are trying to do this. All of us. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and not only not only with just the general situation, but if you even just isolate the educational situation and you're trying to do work that you may not yeah, really know yeah. how, to, how to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who else, who of us isn't more anxious? <laughs> you know, it's like I want to know that. Uh, Austin is uh, the only one. Austin's the only one who's not more anxious during COVID-19. Yeah. So. <laughs> so it sounds like we do need to maybe make some modifications in what we're we're being asked to do, you know, with our students. Um, and you're right, Bobby, we've talked to a lot of parents about this and how you can, you know, different strategies that may be splitting things up or, or just not working on something if it's not working right. until we can get a better handle on, you right. know, how what we should be doing. So yes. from your perspective, Hillary, what what can we do if we see that as a parent, we identify mm -hmm. that as, hey, I need to modify this. This worksheet's not going to work this way. I can't do 16 problems. We can only handle three. What what, if anything, should we be doing to to discuss that and bring that into the, the IEP or or let the, the, the district know what's happening? It's a great question. I mean, you at first you have to look at the impact that the anxiety or depression is having on their education, right? So first you have to address that in the sense of um, what if the student is more anxious, if they're not sleeping at night as a result of, you know, they're not sh just every their whole routine is messed up or they're anxious about the next day, you might want to ask for parent training or you might want to ask for a, B a BCBA consult or a counseling consult um, or in, in ten, in more intensive counseling. And the reason that I'm bringing in BCBA or counseling is because just in my experience in, in doing this, I've noticed that some people, some professionals are just more, are, are better at identifying anxiety in individuals with developmental disabilities than others. So I don't really care whether it's a BCBA or a therapist, as long as they are skilled or trained in identifying the source or cause of anxiety for somebody with developmental disabilities, okay? So we don't want to assume that it's just because they're sitting in front of a computer that they're anxious. There might be some other reasons that their their anxiety is higher. So just having making sure somebody who is highly qualified in identifying somebody with developmental disabilities, something to ask for through the IEP. So counseling, a BCBA, if you need modifications to the homework assignments, then you that's that's a reasonable accommodation to ask for. If you need to be broken up, 
Um, so they're only sitting in front of a computer for 10 minutes rather than two hours. That That's a reasonable accommodation to ask for. Um, if you need frequent breaks, similar to what you would do in school, you, that's, that, those are reasonable accommodations. Um, if, you, if the parent can't sit in front of the computer with the student the whole time, then it might not, it just, it's just reality right now. So they provide the services to the maximum extent possible and you deal with it later. So to Bobby's point, don't go uh, above and beyond in the sense of causing everybody stress to try to get the assignments done. First of all, if your child is at an elevated state, they're not gonna learn the material anyway. You have to wait for them to calm down um, as Bobby has taught me. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, taking it further, you know, it's, a, it's if, you're ele if you're anxious, then they're, then they're gonna feed off of it. So don't get, so just do what you can. Um, and if service and try to think outside of the box, maybe a para can be providing the one-on-one -on -one instruction if the student has a good relationship with the para. Um, you can modify who's delivering the instruction just to make to to help facilitate facilitate the event. Okay, great. Um, we have time for just one more question. We're, we're going to be closing this up just in a couple minutes. And uh, it's just, and I don't know that there is a solid answer on this, or just maybe to start thinking about some possibilities. We don't even, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but probably face coverings are, are going to be in our future um, and in our students' future, our children's future. So there is a lot of concern that there are students, uh, children who won't, they, that won't wear masks or don't wear masks or are uncomfortable or, you know, whatever that may be. Is there, is there anything, uh, any way that we can address that now or start addressing that so that if that is what comes down the line, then we'll be prepared. So Bobby and I had this conversation before, and uh, there are there are lots of different avenues to explore. Um, but the but and I'll let Bobby talk about the behavioral approaches to that. But um, just from a, it's, there, there's a possibility that schools might take a position that students can't come to school if they're not wearing a mask. I mean, they haven't come across and said this yet, but I. I I'm sure it's going to come up um, or they can't say in a, they, they, they either can't come to school or if they're never going to do it, then we're, we're not going to try. Um, and under those circumstances, you should definitely try. Um, maybe you can start implementing a goal now, teaching your child to wear the mask and ex gradually expose them to it. What I can tell you is that districts are not going to be permitted to say under no circumstances, can you not come to school for, you know, if, if you're not wearing a mask, they're going to have to make other reasonable modifications or accommodations to enable your to make sure that your child gets access to their education. Well, that's a that's a, a stress relieved, you know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and Bobby, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I'm just going to say a couple things, and and the first one I want to just really stress is that whenever we say that our child will never do something, um, that that's a really um, challenging thing to put out there, and one challenging because our 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 districts have sometimes told us that our children will never do something, and we as parents have said that's not true. So be careful when you say my child will never do something. But the other thing I want you to be really careful about when you're talking about it is just to say what are the supports that the child will need in order to be able to wear it. So do you need an OT to help desensitize, you know, areas of the face? Do you need somebody to practice putting something just an inch away from the face? Because is, is it an anxiety-driven problem that they're having? So what is the reason why you think they may not put this on at this moment? But what are the supports that have helped them to get past other things such as this, you know, tags in the back of their shirts or waistbands on their pants? Um, there's so many things. And so can we work collaboratively collaboratively with our OTs and really just um, work on desensitizing now or find, you know, there's so many different varieties of ways to make masks now. What are some of the things that we could do? You know, I know there are families that have said my child will never wear a hat in the winter. You know, I think we can get all of these things to happen as long as we're working on them together and it becomes that goal to, to, to make that happen. Because if we say they never will, our, one of our biggest problems is they will not be included in a lot of community places that insist that this is part of our future now and and that's not something we're looking to do either is to diminish the size of their world that that is already very small so it has to be a priority for people to work on just 
try to try to isolate what the challenges you think will be. Yes, mm -hmm. they're going to rip it off a hundred times, and we'll mm -hmm. put it back on a hundred and one. You know, so mm -hmm. that's kind of how it works. And and but we'll put it on gently. <laughs> you know, so okay. great, great advice. Okay, I think this was really great. Um, it was just about a half an hour, but I think we we um, handled some some big questions here. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you both so much, not only for doing this, but all your support during the COVID crisis and way beyond that for years and years, everything that both of you have meant to POAC. And especially today on Giving Tuesday, I want to thank you both. And um, just remind everybody out there, um, it is Giving Tuesday. We we do ask you if you can become a walk team captain. You go to POACwalk.org, um, start a walk team uh, or a Facebook fundraiser for us. It would be really super helpful. Donations are down, as you can imagine. This is our walk season. We would have been starting our walks this weekend and going right through May. And we miss that. And we miss everybody out there. Um, so please, if you're able to, it's uh, www.poacwalk.org. Stay with us. We're going to shut this um, Facebook Live session down now. And then we're going to come right back at um, fourth in one minute at 430 with our yoga instructor again with a couple of tips for relaxation. And then we're going to move on to uh, Mr. Scott, the music man. So again, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Goodbye. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.